The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. The state of California recently passed the Fair Pay to Play Act, legalizing payments to college athletes. What does this mean for the nation's nearly 500,000 college athletes and for university athletics departments across the nation? How will the NCAA respond to this action? And more importantly, what are the issues in paying college athletes who already receive free tuition, room and, and, room and board. Joining me on the show today to talk about the latest effort to pay college athletes is my colleague from the Johnson Center, Dr. Scott Burns, who is also a major college sports fan. So welcome back to the show, Scott. Thanks. It's uh, good to be back on. So first off, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about this act that uh, California recently passed, and uh, you know, because it's been described as like uh, allowing pay for uh, college athletes, but I think the reality is a little more involved than, than mm -hmm. that. Yeah, so it's called the Fair Pay to Play Act. Um, it was passed into law and signed by Governor Gavin Newsom in California uh, this past month. And in effect, what the law says, we want to break it down to its simplest elements, um, it allows student athletes at, col at c colleges in California to be compensated for their name, image, and likeness, which basically means if you're a college athlete, right now under NCAA rules, you're prohibited from taking money for endorsements or advertising, or even mm -hmm. if you try to monetize a YouTube channel. Maybe you make highlights of some of your best plays and you put it on YouTube and you want to sell ads on that. NCAA rules do not allow you to make any money off your name, image, and likeness. Another common thing that we see in regards to this topic is video games. Mm -hmm. For a long time, there were things like NCAA football uh, video games, where and even basketball mm -hmm. and some other sports, and the players could not be compensated for the fact mm -hmm. that it was their name, image, and likeness that was being used in these video games. So that's what kind of spurred this. And the California bill allows student athletes now to be paid and to be used in advertising and for things of this nature. Um, that's one of the first key components of the bill. Mm -hmm. It prevents the NCAA from banning or prohibiting students from play simply for receiving money. Okay. Or their name, image, and likeness. The second part that I think is often overlooked is the fact that it also allows student athletes to contract with agents. Mm -hmm. um, under current rules, you cannot do that until you have either exhausted your eligibility or graduated or just left college athletics and declared for professional mm -hmm. sports in whatever sport you might play. Um, that's a big deal because, especially imagine if you're a big marquee college football player, a two attack of Viola at the University of Alabama. Right now, you can't contract with an agent, which means that you can't receive any benefits from that agent, or you can't necessarily receive legal advice from that agent um, mm -hmm. in advance of going pro and declaring for the NFL draft. With this bill, players would be able to start planning for the future uh, more quickly. They could even receive some payments from the agent to help them get by and help support their families while they're playing college sports. So those are the two key components of this bill. Now, uh, to make the point about, like, uh, student athletes being able to um, earn money from their image and likeness. Mm -hmm. I mean, other college students can do this all already, right? If you have a, a, a YouTube right. channel or, or whatever, you, you can make money from your YouTube channel, correct? Right. So that's one of the main arguments that people bring up in support of this bill and bills like this is that it does seem unfair that every other student at a university, if they're not a student athlete, can earn money from their name, image, and likeness. Mm -hmm. uh, the example that you and I have talked about actually is Carson King. He's a student at the University of Iowa who Recently, they had a big football game, and he held up a sign um, basically saying, you know, send beer money, and he had his Venmo account listed so that people could send him money to buy more beer. Um, people wound up sending him over a million dollars, ironically enough, and then uh, he made the announcement uh, in a very selfless manner. It was a very respectable motion. He basically said, look, I'm not going to actually keep this, do this money. I'm going to donate it to the Iowa Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so he's actually donating it to charity. The fact that he was a student in the stands allowed him to do that because he wasn't a student athlete. But if he instead was a player on the playing field and he had done something like this and received money to his Venmo account, he would have been prohibited from playing. He would have been banned from playing. So a lot of people point to th instances like that where any other student on the campus can mm -hmm. make money, whether they have a YouTube channel or if they do advertising for local TV. Right. But simply 
student athletes are the ones who are excluded from being able to do this as being kind of an equity issue. Mm -hmm. And and so the, then it would be possible then you know for a, a Tua to possibly have a, a sponsorship deal because I know we had the recent um, uh, Adidas uh, right. federal bribery scandal where mm -hmm. uh, shoe companies were in effect. Uh, uh, I guess they were found guilty of sending yeah. a, a illegal payments to some athletes to try to get them to sign with a, a program that was that they had a contract with, right? Right. This is a really deep problem, especially in college basketball, men's mm -hmm. basketball. Um, the NCAA corruption scandal that broke out over the past few years. Um, basically what happened in that investigation was so many different schools. The marquee programs were ones like Kansas that were found uh, of you know dealing with all these kind of underground shady agents and paying players but the truth is they found that the problem was so widespread it wasn't just at places like Kansas and Arizona but it was at dozens of schools across the nation marquee programs um, it became such a mess for the NCAA that they kind of just had to take a hands-off approach we'll see what they wind up doing but unfortunately it revealed that there is such a deep underground economy for these student athletes they are getting paid just not in transparent ways mm -hmm. Um, that it created a huge amount of chaos for the NCAA. Now, uh, some other states have already responded to, to uh, mm -hmm. California's bill with uh, bill, bills of their own. I, as far as I know, nobody else has passed this yet. But right. this is actually uh, providing us an example of how competition between states can sometimes help lead to, to uh, legal change, right? Right. Um, a lot. Of, I think there's about seven or eight other states now, New York, South Carolina, Florida, who have at least proposed very similar bills to what mm -hmm. was passed in California. All of them have kind of some minor nuances and differences, but you're indeed seeing the fact that this is a popular idea. A lot of people view this issue of paying college athletes as an idea whose time has come. And so you're seeing a lot of other states trying to build on that momentum. A lot of state legislators who are trying to increase their uh, name recognition and get some good PR have been putting forward their own bills that are really, in essence, similar to the California bill. Again, usually with a little bit of differences so that they can set mm -hmm. themselves apart. But yeah, this is something that is, I think, going to wind up being done by dozens of states across the country. And it's, it's going to become a nationwide issue for the NCAA eventually, not just California itself. Now, uh, the California bill doesn't actually go into effect, I think, until 2023. That's right. And, and it's still not completely clear what mm -hmm. the NCAA response is going to be, right? Right. So the reason it doesn't go into effect until 2023 is basically to give the NCAA time to kind of get... Uh, get their strategy straight, figure mm -hmm. out what they want to do, change whatever rules they might need to. Um, that's exactly what Gavin Newsom said. Was, Look, we're going to give the NCAA time to change because right now the NCAA has about two options. They can either ban all California schools from competing in the NCAA. Well, California is the world's fifth largest economy and the most populous state in the United States, so that doesn't seem too likely. It'd be mm -hmm. weird to have a college football season without USC, Stanford, UCLA, not to mention other sports like basketball. So that doesn't seem like something the NCAA would be willing to do. The second option, though, is for the NCAA to say, okay, we're going to change the rules nationwide so that California is not the only bill that allows this. The goal in either case is to have a level playing field. Right now, the NCAA is talking um, a very hard game to California about how, look, if you don't overturn this, then we will just prohibit you from playing. Mm -hmm. But again, that's not really a threat that they can back up. Mm -hmm. So I think that you are going to start to see the NCAA. In fact, they've already formed working groups to talk about precisely this issue. So I'd expect in the next year or two, especially as other states start to jump on this issue and it becomes obvious that this is not going to be just limited to California, you're going to see the NCAA try to make some changes so that this is not just a one-state issue. Now, th this leads us into the bigger issue of, of whether college athletes should be getting paid. Right. And before we get into the question of whether they should get paid, I guess mean, we should probably recognize that. I mean, sometimes in, the, mm -hmm. in this discussion about whether athletes uh, should get paid or not, uh, some people refer to them as just currently being exploited or completely right. taken advantage of. I mean, that's not like completely true, you know, is it? It's an overstatement. Uh, I sympathize with the notion that we could be doing more, mm -hmm. that student athletes could be earning more based on what they uh, bring into the athletic departments and universities they represent. But it's not the case that they are literally unpaid labor that gets no benefits at all. They get pretty ample benefits, especially mm -hmm. if you're a marquee player um, at a marquee institution. Um, in addition to things like tuition and paying for college-related expenses, room and board, textbooks, you also get state-of-the-art uh, technology that's, that helps you with your health. So you get state-of-the-art health care mm -hmm. quality services. You can get surgeries and all sorts of things. Just look at, to use Tua again as an example, at Alabama, he was able to get 
uh, cutting edge surgery to repair his high ankle sprain and he's going to be healthy to go against LSU in a few weeks. That's something that a lot of college students might not be able to afford necessarily. So mm -hmm. you do have access to a lot of things. Another good example is the nutrition programs. Right. You get free food every day and it's not just free fast food. This is, if you look at schools like Alabama and LSU, their nutrition centers are like five-star restaurants. Mm -hmm. They have incredible services at their disposal. But again, it's not really one for one because most of these players, if you ask them, what would you rather have? $150,000 or really nice benefits and healthcare services and free textbooks and tuition? Most of them would probably say, I'd take the money because mm -hmm. I'd rather have the choice over how to use that money than just have these in-kind benefits given to me. Um, and so that's really what the key argument is, is what's the most fair way to compensate players uh, based on what they do. And to some extent, uh, if the players aren't going to get paid, the economics shows that, well, the money that could have gone to them in pay is likely to go into these other things like these the state of the art locker rooms and, and, and uh, you know, sports and nutrition programs, exactly. right? There, kind of an old economic principle that people are going to get paid one way or another if mm -hmm. they provide a valuable service. So when you ban something, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen at all. I use the example of prohibition a lot of times. I talk about um, college sports and in the same way that in the 1920s and 30s in this country, we banned alcohol sale. We prohibited alcohol sales. Did that mean that people in the U.S. stopped drinking? Lord knows that didn't mean that people in the United States stopped drinking. And in fact, if you look at the statistics, drinking didn't go down at all. And there was actually more uh, alcohol-related deaths and negative instances than there were when alcohol was legal. Prohibition was a massive failure. All it did was give rise to things like underground economies, the rise of the mafia who wound up selling alcohol in these cases, and just the widespread uh, dispersion of less quality versions of these drinks. Mm -hmm. If you don't have large companies producing them who are regulated and who have a profit-maximizing incentive to create safe, good products, but rather people making moonshine in their bathtubs, it's going to be a lot less safe for consumers. So you kind of see similar dynamics here where even though the NCAA bans pay, uh, players from being paid, that doesn't mean that players aren't receiving benefits, even if under the table. Mm -hmm. If you're a really marquee player, especially in a sport like basketball, we talk about these shoe deals, um, you're going to find a way to make money off of that. Unfortunately, what these rules do, an unintended consequence of the NCAA's cartel, is that it forces these economic interactions to be under the table and to take place with some more kind of unsavory elements of society. Uh, kind of middlemen who, especially if you look mm -hmm. at NCAA basketball, yeah. aren't necessarily the type of people that you want interacting with 16, 17, 18 year old kids. Um, there's a lot of room for ex exploitation and corruption and so it's just a negative unintended consequence of this prohibition on player pay. So you, you, you mentioned this, we need to get into this, uh, the, mm -hmm. the role that the NCAA plays in this, and th that is, of course, the uh, National Collegiate Athletic Association, the, right. the group that uh, regulates, uh, sets the rules for different uh, intercollegiate sports in, mm -hmm. you know, so in the competition, uh, championship competitions, right. and then also enforces these rules. And they've ha enforced this rule against uh, pay players receiving mm -hmm. unapproved benefits, right? Yeah, and it's worth noting that the NCAA has jurisdiction over more than 1,100 colleges across the country. It's got three different divisions, Division I being the largest schools and programs and Division III being the smaller ones. Uh, but one of the things I do note is that it's not a government agency. The NCAA is a private, mm -hmm. voluntary organization. These schools join the NCAA and agree, basically, to the rules that it puts forward. Right. Now, that said, the colleges and universities and athletic departments that comprise the NCAA system, its members, do have a lot of say over NCAA policies. Right. In the same way that your homeowners association, that's really more what the NCAA is like. It's not like the police department or the FBI. It's more like a homeowners association. If all the members of a subdivision or a community want to change the rules for their subdivision, they can get together and do that. Right. The same thing applies here for colleges and athletic departments. If they want the NCAA to change its rules, if there's relative unanimity on an issue, then the NCAA can change. But its role, as we'll talk about now, it plays the role of a cartel because it's really the only game in town when it mm -hmm. comes to regulating college sports. There's no other competing agencies or groups. It's just the NCAA, which does give them a disproportional amount of power right. in affecting how these games are regulated. Yeah, to the you, know, you mentioned there are 1,100 uh, colleges mm -hmm. and universities that are part of the NCAA and like over 100 that play the highest level of, of right. uh, college football. 
If they could get to, they, they're certainly not a monopolist because they're not a, a mm -hmm. single actor in this case, but they would have an interest collectively if they could to mm -hmm. avoid paying players because, I mean, everybody prefers to have more money yourself. So if, yeah. you're, you're, take, if you're bringing in the, the billions of dollars in revenue every year, yeah. and you could avoid paying oh, yeah. somebody you know, the, the full amount that they, in effect, are earning for you, you'd have an interest in doing that, right? Oh yeah, that's definitely sensible. And I think that's some of what you're seeing in these cases when colleges and universities come out against California's bill. Um, that said, we talked about the fact that in, even though the NCAA basically has a monopoly over regulating college sports, there are other forms of competition in just mm -hmm. about every, every sport. The really, I'd say, two main exceptions to this idea of there being alternatives to playing college sports. So if you're a volleyball player, a lot of marquee high school volleyball players will go play in Europe professionally. Um, baseball players, if you're really good in high school, you don't have to go to college. Mm -hmm. You can get drafted by the majors and play in the minor leagues. The two sports I'd say really don't have that system in place well are football and then men's basketball. Um, in both cases, the NFL prohibits you from uh, being drafted and joining the league unless you've been out of high school for a certain duration of time. So you basically right. have to go to college uh, and play college if you want to continue to play football and put yourself in a position to be drafted. You've got mm -hmm. to play for at least three years. There was no minor league system in place for really decades that was a viable alternative. You could say, well, they could try to go to Europe and play, or maybe even Canadian uh, league, if that might be an option. That's not really a viable option relative to college football. But what you're seeing is that that's changing a lot. Now with things like the XFL, the XFL has said that, look, we're going to allow kids as young as 18, straight out of high school, to come play professional football in the United States and get paid six figures for doing so. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be competition in college football, which there's really never been. It's kind of been almost an accident of history that we have this very popular form of amateur athletics that's tied to colleges and universities right. as opposed to having a minor league system. But in basketball, the competition's coming too. Again, now that the NBA doesn't allow you to come straight out of high school, you have to go to college for at least one year, well, now players have the option of going and playing in NBA Europe. They have the option of playing in the G League. The G League, the NBA's kind of minor league, has adjusted its rules so that college, um, so that you don't have to go to college to play in the G League and make six figures. So what that means, that competition, what that really means is that that's going to pressure the NCAA to change its policies to keep marquee players from going straight to the pros and to make it more attractive to play in college. Mm -hmm. Now, if any... Uh cartel is going to attempt to persist for any period of time or mm -hmm. to, to be effective, what we always uh, tell our students is that a cartel has to wait, have a way to punish anybody who's going to try to right. uh, break the cartel or deviate from the cartel. Mm -hmm. And in the NCA case, I mean, the, they yeah. do sanction schools that where payments to, to players are, are occurring if they, can, if they can find it, right? Yeah. If you violate the club's rules, you can get kicked out of the club. Mm -hmm. SMU is a famous case from the 1980s when they got the uh, what's called the death penalty. They were prohibited, uh, especially their football program, from uh, really from existing for a while, but from playing in bowl games and things like that, which just decimated uh, their football program. Uh, but yeah, that is how the NCAA can try to regulate its members. It can threaten to kick them out of the association or to ban them from postseason play. And that's supposed to be what kind of keeps people in line. And in, in this case in particular, SMU had been one of the weakest teams in the Southwestern Conference for many years. And mm -hmm. I, I think you know, they, they got a bunch of their donors together and decided like, okay, yeah. let's, let's uh, donate some money to pay some pay players like Eric Dickerson and Craig James. Yeah. And, and they actually got good and they, they won a conference title. And, mm -hmm. But you know, then, then uh, the, the punishment came down on them, right? Yeah, they, they flew too close to the sun and unfortunately it didn't pan out for them too well in the long run. But again, it's worth noting with these policies, whether it's prohibiting uh, players from being paid or any other rules, it's going to be difficult to enforce if there are options, if there is competition. And more importantly, you're never going to ban it completely. Just because um, you do have rules on the books at the NCAA against pl uh, players being paid, it doesn't mean that no one's getting any type of benefit that's not permitted by law. Mm -hmm. All this means that this activity, which is inevitably going to happen, is now happening under the table. Now, you, you mentioned, uh, we've talked about how much you know, players should be getting paid or, if, if, or yeah. what economics could uh, produce for that. Now, I mean, college football generates billions of dollars of yeah. revenue every year, but it's not just the players that are involved in putting on that spectacle. Not to say mm -hmm. that, that, that we as professors have anything to do with it, but I mean, right. there, you do have to have a facility, a stadium, you do have to have coaches, oh, you do have to have uh, trainers and, and uh, 
you know, a, a lot of support people, even though mm -hmm. you, since a lot of that revenue comes from television, you have to have people to broadcast the game and announce right. the game. And so that it, with all these different uh, things you have to put together, all these different ingredients or, or inputs, uh, mm -hmm. how is it that economists would say that, that with, what's our guide for any one of them getting paid? Well, the kind of technical term that we use in economics for what determines how much you can get paid is your marginal revenue product. Mm -hmm. That's just a kind of fancy way of saying that you're paid based on your productivity. You're paid based on how much revenue you bring into your fir firm or your institution. And so what we'd expect to see in college sports, if college athletes were allowed to be paid, is not that every p player would get paid the same amount. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have actually proposed something like that, like every student athlete gets the same stipend. That wouldn't happen if you had a market. In the same way that if you look at the NFL today or the NBA, players within a team are not paid the same amount. They're paid based on basically how good they are and how much value they add to the organization. So that's the kind of market force that you'd see. If I were working uh, as a newspaper boy, passing out newspapers, and I could provide $15 an hour worth of revenue for the newspaper company, then we'd say that the most that I'd get paid is at $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. So that's what determines how, how much you get paid is your productivity. And in college sports, someone like, a, again, I hate to keep using Tua as an example, especially since I'm an LSU fan and he's a big rival, but Tua would probably get paid a lot more than the third string defensive end mm -hmm. on Alabama's team. Um, and we see that in the NFL, so it's not really an equity right. issue. Most people understand why that's the case. Um, but yeah, those are the forces that determine how much players could get paid. Yeah, that's how much they could get paid. Mm -hmm. How is it that, you know, as we, if we look at the NFL, I mean, Steph Curry and Aaron Rodgers right. make close to, to $40 million a year. What is it that, because we also mentioned that the college athletes volunteer for right. the, the jobs they have. They, nobody's uh, twisting mm -hmm. their arms to force them to go and, and, and play for these big time colleges, even though they have to put in a lot of work. Mm -hmm. What is it that, that gets salaries uh, uh, to this level possibly? Right. Well, if the most you're going to get paid is going to be based on your productivity, your marginal revenue product, the least that you're going to be willing to accept is going to be based on competition and your opportunity costs, what the next best alternative is. So one of the reasons that colleges have been able to get away with not paying players is precisely because of what we just talked about earlier. The fact that in sports like football and men's basketball, which are the big revenue generators, there hasn't been any, any other viable alternative for players mm -hmm. to go into. Their best option, if you're a great football player, is to go play at a school like University of Alabama, Ohio State, LSU, Troy, um, and uh, get your name out there, play really well, and then get drafted by the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, but without that competition, there's nothing that necessarily is going to guarantee that your pay is going to be bid up over time. It's when you start interjecting competition, whether it's from outside organizations, um, like the XFL that I talked about, or the NBA G League, or just internal change. Like if the NCAA decided to change its rules to allow players across the country to be paid based on name, image, and likeness or something, that's how you'd have upward pressure put mm -hmm. on pay. So it's not so much um, productivity that's limiting how much players are being paid. It's those rules that are in place that kind of determine the lower end. It's the fact that there hasn't been much competition. Mm -hmm. That's what we're, those of us who would like to see players get paid more um, are hoping to see change to those rules. And so if the, the, the Golden State Warriors weren't going to pay Steph Curry, mm -hmm. some other team could. Exactly. And, and There's 30 other teams in the NBA who would be more than happy to pay them. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and just to put this in, in some perspective, I mean, Pro, professional sports leagues have done things over the years to try to keep salaries mm -hmm. artificially lower, not pay, pay players their marginal right. revenue product they have, either, yeah. right? They have salary caps and things yeah. like that, but they still have plenty enough of a market where there is a variation in how much players are paid based on how good they are, how much what the market is for them, mm -hmm. and that's what allows those leagues to be so productive. And uh, for decades in uh, Major League Baseball, based about a century, they had mm -hmm. the thing called the Reserve Clause. That right. you know, it was when the Reserve Clause broke down that free agency came into Major League Baseball, right. and you got to have one team bidding against another, and, and right. that is the kind of thing that could really help bid up the, the salaries. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that's uh, relevant to this discussion is uh, perhaps uh, yeah. and in uh, some details about the California law might uh, get around this is mm -hmm. the uh, idea of, of title nine and uh, the gender equity I issue right. for college sports mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about t title nine and how this uh, po possibly applies to the pay for uh, college athletes right so title nine basically requires some degree of gender equity especially in things like college sports if you receive money from the federal government um, then you have to provide 
relatively equal opportunities across genders in different sports. Um, you mentioned that the California bill is able to kind of circumvent Title IX because bear in mind that with the California bill, it's not the athletic departments and colleges that mm -hmm. are largely publicly funded that are paying athletes directly. The law basically just allows student athletes to make money from outside organizations, so advertising deals. They're not being paid by the university directly, but rather from third parties. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of allows them to get around Title IX, but suppose that instead the law said that athletic departments have to pay student athletes. Mm -hmm. In that case, because the athletic departments and the universities you're associated with are usually, in large part at least, publicly funded, then they would have to provide some level of equity in terms of things like pay. Um, they wouldn't be able to pay the star football player $500,000, but not play, pay the women's soccer uh, player anything. Um, that would introduce a lot of complications, because one of the things that we've talked about and that's been emphasized in the debate around this California bill is the fact that if you really look at it financially, the two sports that generate, that really the only two profitable college sports are football and then men's basketball. The other sports tend to lose money. And so if you did have a market, it might be the case that students, uh, you know, a baseball player might not get paid anything, whereas someone like Tua Tagovailoa would be making maybe a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So that introduces a whole other question um, of equity. Should we allow rules to be in place, you know, a system to be in place in the NCAA and college sports where some athletes, namely athletes in football and men's basketball, get paid a lot of money, but other student athletes don't get paid right. much of anything? You know, I think the one particular parallel here would be men's and women's basketball. Right. And, and you know, certainly some people would come back and say, like, oh, the women's uh, basketball players work just as hard. Yep. They spend as many hours practicing. They, they, they work just as hard as their, mm -hmm. at their craft as, as the uh, men's basketball players do. You know, it would be unfair for them not to, not to get paid like the men's basketball players would be, right? Right. Um, and, and look, that's one of those issues where, and I'm a big fan of women's basketball, but their pay would be determined in effect by the fan base, how many people show mm -hmm. up to the games, the attendance, and what the demand is, how much they could generate in TV revenue for those games being aired. So people get upset sometimes about the fact that there would be inequities in how much athletes were paid, but they neglect the fact that things like maybe men's basketball and women's basketball to consumers are two different products. Mm -hmm. Men's basketball generates tens of billions of dollars a year, whereas women's basketball doesn't generate as much. That doesn't necessarily mean that that should continue to be the case, but the argument there is that if you're a fan of women's sports and you want to see more pay equity, um, you need to go out and support those teams. You need to buy season tickets, you need to pay and make sure that your TV provider covers those games, because unfortunately, if we tried to pass a law that said that those athletes, men and women, have to get paid the same amount, that would wind up hurting a lot of female athletes. Those sport programs might not be allowed, not, might not be financially viable. They might not exist anymore if you pass laws like that. So mm -hmm. it'd be better to see a market uh, provide the solution than have anything top down imposed. And I guess one final the issue about equity is that there, there could also be issues, uh, like say, on the football team. If mm -hmm. Tua is getting paid, a, a lot right. more than like say the guys blocking for mm -hmm. him or, or other members of the team that could cause some frictions within the teams as well it could I'm not too worried about that simply because we see that in the NFL right now and, the, mm -hmm. and in the NBA there's plenty of a pay disparity within locker rooms on each of these teams but uh, most of the players kind of get that they understand who the marquee guys are and you know some of the more marginal guys well, thanks very much for, for coming on and talk about this. Yeah. This is a topic that I'm sure lots of our, our viewers are very interested in. Mm -hmm. And thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations.